Science, engineering, medicine, medicine chemistry, physics, biology, humanities, cardiology, computer, public health, global science, Yes, hello again everyone, I'm Gareth Mitchell and today, throat infections in children and a declaration on animal research. Both of those are stories in our news section. Also here in our podcast studio are two imperial researchers to give their expert take on the recent Nobel Prize announcements and those who could be tomorrow's Nobel Prize winners were at the Commemoration Day graduation ceremonies. Also today, probing the science behind our fears. It's important science here. All the way through, that's okay. it. Decapitation. In, in fairness, it was not a real cat, but most people were quite shocked by that. But it was an important reenactment of some rather weird research back in the 19th century. All right, let's have some news. Sam Wong is here from the Communications and Development Division. And uh, first of all, Sam, we are going to be talking about uh, about throat infections. Tell me more. Yeah, so Dr Liz Koshi from the School of Public Health and her colleagues have done a study looking at the number of children admitted to hospital for acute throat infections between 1999 and 2010. And they found quite a startling rise of 76% in the number of children hospitalised for, for these infections. Can they explain anything about why that rise has come about? So one of the concerns that motivated the study was that they thought that um, a decline in the rates of tonsillectomy operations was leading to an increase in hospital admissions because children were then getting more severe cases of, of tonsillitis and having to go to hospital. And they also wanted to look at whether performing fewer tonsillectomies was associated with higher rates of complications, such as quinsy, which is an abscess that you can get when infection spreads from a tonsil to a surrounding area. But it turns out that there wasn't a link between tonsillectomy trends and the admission rates or the severity of throat infections or quinsy, and they looked at a number of different explanations. So one factor they think might have contributed would be changes in the provision of -of out-of-hours care in GP practices and uh, changes in in accident and emergency. So there was a target set of a a sort of four-hour maximum waiting time in A&E. They think that doctors being under more pressure might have then been more likely to admit children to hospital when otherwise they might have been sent home or, or managed in the community. It's not necessarily that rates of throat infection have increased, it's just that more of them are presented to hospitals then? That's exactly it. They don't think there's a big increase in throat infections, it's just that a few different factors might have meant that more children are being admitted to hospital with these cases who would previously have been dealt with in the community. So usually with a study like this you'd say, well we've got this result, therefore it suggests better intervention, that kind of thing. Maybe this study is saying the opposite then. Mm. One of the important messages is the fact that declining tonsillectomy rates doesn't lead to an increase in complications and more severe cases of disease. Tonsillectomy is a major operation. It's quite costly. So it seems sensible that doctors are keeping a high threshold for referring children with recurrent throat infections to have a tonsillectomy. And in fact, this research is sort of reassuring that that that's not leading to increased problems. And actually, there there are other reasons why more children seem to be admitted to hospital with acute throat infections. All right, Sam, thank you very much indeed for that. Now, Kerry Noble is also here, also of the Communications and Development Division here at Imperial. Kerry, we've had in the last week a declaration to which Imperial is a signatory when it comes to openness in animal research. First of all, before we hear about the declaration, what about the context behind all this? Well, a great deal of scientific research is underpinned by animal studies. It's, it's a very small amount of scientific research, but it is important. And certainly all of the diseases that affect humans in some way, in order to tackle them, you know, animal studies are involved in, in one way, shape or form. So it's a pretty important part of, of science. Especially because I'm sure there are probably many scientists whose work isn't directly involving animal studies, but which is nevertheless underpinned by animal studies elsewhere. Exactly, exactly. And and that's why this declaration, which we've signed up to, and well, 15 universities in total, and lots of other research organisations, research funders, medical charities have signed up to. That's why it's important. Because there is a background to this, which is that, you know, researchers who do talk about their work have been 
the subject of terrorist activity by animal rights extremists. And although that's relatively rare, you know, it has caused fear amongst researchers and some feel that it's not safe for them to talk about research that they do involving animals. So that's sort of the perspective from the researchers. But what about on the part of, of the public? What do we know about attitudes to uh, animal studies and animal research? So on the whole, the majority of the public do understand that medical research requires the use of animals. And under those circumstances, they accept it. But the government does a regular survey of public attitudes around this area. And they've released the results of the most recent one and found that there has been a slight decline, actually, in in the public support for for this type of research. And so this declaration is one way that perhaps we may be able to meet that change and perhaps make some difference by making sure that the public understand why the research is important and, you know, just to look at the, the, the massive scope of diseases that this kind of research will help to tackle, that perhaps we might be able to make sure that the that, that public do continue to understand and to accept that this research needs to go on. And so what does this all mean for Imperial itself? What it means is that scientists here at Imperial and at other research institutions around the UK will be able to stand up as a group and feel that they're safe and supported to be able to talk about the work they do in animals and why it's important. Great. Well, Kerry, thank you very much indeed for that. That was the news. Now, also in the news over recent weeks, of course, has been the announcement of the Nobel Prizes. And uh, we have two people from Imperial here to discuss them. We're going to talk about the Chemistry Prize first with uh, Dr. Bernadette Byrne, who's a reader in molecular membrane biology here at Imperial. The winners were Professor Bob Lefkowitz and Professor Brian Kabilke. Looking at the piece of paper with the prize written on it, it's for G-protein coupling. So just tell us a bit more about about what that actually means. So uh, surrounding every cell in our bodies is this fatty layer, cell membrane. There are molecules circulating around our bodies all the time. And these, some of these can't get across the membrane. So they interact with this very special protein called a receptor. And once they interact with this receptor protein, the protein changes shape. And then this transfers a signal through this coupling mechanism to another protein into the cell and the cell responds to that change. And in this particular example, it's looking at adrenaline. So presumably something happens to you, you have a shock or I don't know, you're being predated by a lion or whatever it is. And then something needs to happen in the cells to bring out the the fight or flight response, whatever it's going to be, to run away from danger. Tell us about how the the G protein coupling, I suppose, mediates that, that communication. So what happens is the adrenaline interacts or binds to this receptor. The receptor then changes its shape. And then this stimulates what we call a signalling cascade inside the cell. The body starts to produce lots and lots of energy. So it basically just prepares you for that moment where you're really going to have to either fight for your life or you're going to have to run like mad. How were the Nobel Prize winners able to identify this communication mechanism? What kind of techniques were they using? So the work that was done by Bob Lefkowitz, first of all, identified that there was some mechanism by which this information was getting into the cell. And what they did was they used uh, DNA cloning to identify the actual gene sequence corresponding to what's called the beta adrenergic receptor that, that mediates this interaction with the adrenaline. Where do we go from here then? Are are people talking about this as having potential uses in in medicine? Oh, absolutely. So between 30 and 50% of all currently prescribed drugs act through G-protein coupled receptors. But with the work from Brian Kabilka's lab, suddenly now we have these very detailed snapshots of exactly what the protein looks like. And so because we now know what the receptors look like, we can much better design drugs to bind into those receptors. Uh, Finally, then, it must be exciting. There must be a spring in your step as you all kind of head for the lab, aware of how this Nobel Prize has been awarded. Uh, It's so great that it's been uh, awarded in this particular area. I'm not overly surprised because the last five or six years or so have seen tremendous advances in our understanding of how these proteins work. And these two guys, Brian Kabilka and Bob Lefkowitz, they really are amazing scientists and have done more work than anybody else to move this particular research field forward. But I think people are very pleased that our research area has been recognised in this way. 
Great. Well, Bernadette, thank you very much indeed for that. Let's now speak about the Nobel Prize for Physics, which was won by Serge Haroche and Dave Wineland, both of whom are known by Professor Ed Hines here at Imperial. He's chair in physics in the Centre for Cold Matter in the Physics Department, as you might expect. The Nobel Prize was based on research into so-called quantum systems. Well, what is meant by a quantum system? Well, a quantum system is a, a system that is so simple that it behaves according to the laws of quantum mechanics. So let me give you an example. If you take light and try to break it down into the smallest possible amount of light, you'll find that that's a photon. So if you study the behavior of one photon, that's a quantum system. Uh, And it's interesting because its behavior is different from light taken in the bulk. And the same would be true of atoms. If you reduce matter to the simplest possible amount, it's one atom. Uh, unless you smash it up and look what it's made of. But one atom will do for now. So one atom behaves according to quantum mechanics and does things that you wouldn't see if you took a a larger ensemble of many atoms, uh, like the proteins we've just been talking about. I suppose it's uh, easiest to understand this Nobel Prize by thinking separately about the experimental work of the, the two winners. So if we start with Serge Haroche, can you tell me a little bit about what he's actually done? Yes. So he's developed extremely shiny mirrors, so shiny that he can trap light inside a box made of these mirrors. And he's studied the state of light where there is one photon in the box or two photons in the box or three. And as you make your measurement to determine this, gradually the state of the light transforms, according to the laws of quantum mechanics, into a specific number of photons in the box. And he's done this in the lab, which is really important because for many years people thought this was just a kind of theorist's imagining, but now we see that it really does work that way, which gives us hope that we might be able to use them for something practical. The famous thing being the idea that we might make computers more powerful than the current type of computer. Which I suppose brings us on to Dave Wineland's work as well, because he's trapping ions. Also, around that bigger picture of understanding quantum, maybe leading to applications like quantum computing. Tell us a bit more about what Dave's actually done. Yes, an ion is just an atom with with an electron removed. So it's basically single atoms that he's been trapping. So he prepares the atoms and holds them in a trap and interrogates them with light. In fact, there's a lovely symmetry between these two prizes. Harosh traps the light and probes it with atoms, And Dave Wineland traps the atoms and probes it with light. And in both cases, they're trying to make in real life systems which demonstrate, which exhibit the behavior of quantum mechanics and this funny property of of doing several things at once. So it is getting a photon and an atom, which are both in themselves sort of quantum systems, what to interact with each other. And we hear part of the outcome is is so-called action at a distance, which almost implies that the photon does something to the atom that maybe we don't fully understand, or maybe we understand a bit better now thanks to these guys. Yeah, one of the deeply puzzling things about quantum mechanics, which is called entanglement, is that you can prepare a system with two particles each of those particles is doing two things at once. But if you make a measurement which determines that particle number one was doing thing A, then you can know for sure that particle number two was also doing thing A. If, if on the other hand, your measurement says particle number one was doing thing B, then particle number two is doing thing B. And somehow particle number two knows what it's supposed to be doing as a result of your measurement on A, and it knows instantly which sounds absolutely not not right according to the laws of, of basic physics that two things not communicating with each other can somehow appear to be communicating. What kind of applications might that have? Well, this entanglement property is central to the idea about quantum computing. The idea about quantum computing is essentially that if you have quantum bits in your computer instead of classical ones, then you can perform all the calculations at once rather than doing the calculations one at a time. That can only work as a, as a result of the entanglement because bit number two has to sort of keep in its head all the possible things that bit number one is doing simultaneously. 
Uh, and you know both of the winners, Serge and Dave. I think you've worked with one of them as well. Have you had a chance to get any reaction from them about winning the prize? Oh, I got a message from Dave, yeah, who characteristically said that it really was, wasn't at all all his doing and he couldn't possibly have made these experiments work without his collaborators, which is very modest uh, and also true. In fact, both of these scientists work in groups of, of people who are, who are extremely good and brilliant and it's not a one-man job doing experimental physics. So it's been an exciting week or two in your field, I'm sure. Tremendous, yeah, and a long time coming and an absolutely perfect choice of Nobel Prize. Everyone is really pleased for these guys that it's happened. Well, congratulations to them, you and, and, and the whole field as well. Exciting stuff. Ed, thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, now, it was a day of celebration, reflection and congratulation. A day of gowns, photographs and, of course, proud family and friends. Yes, we've just seen the annual Commemoration Day ceremonies where nearly 2,500 undergraduates gathered in the Royal Albert Hall. Also soaking up the atmosphere were Elizabeth Atkin and Andrew Chizewski from Communications and Development. They caught up with some of those graduating. So what were their highlights from 2012? And what advice would they give to other students? I'm Connie and I'm from mathematics. What's been your highlight from 2012? I think it's to graduate and worked very hard and got my degree. I was very happy. And what are you planning to do after graduation? I'm in fact studying law after mathematics, which is a significant change, but I'm loving it as well. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm doing mathematics and computer science. I'm Nathan Farrell and I'm doing mathematics. And what's been your highlight of 2012? Probably the Olympics. I liked watching the women's quarterfinal handball. Um, yeah, for me the Olympics as well. Um, I was actually a volunteer at the Olympic Stadium. So um, I was really close to the action and um, it was just a really good experience being there and um, seeing like, everyone like really cheering everyone. And, make the most of the time because it goes really quick because I can't believe like three years are just over just like that so um, I'd say make the most of the opportunities you have for university and have fun as well that's very important. <laughs> I would say as soon as you start university in that freshers week speak to as many people as you can in your year and in other years as well just speak to as many people and make as many friends as you can from the beginning. Could you tell me your name and your subject? Uh, Ashish Kare, uh, maths, maths, mathematics. Yeah. Yeah. And can I ask what's been your highlight of 2012? Uh, I'd have to actually have to say graduation so far because I think you study around the Royal Albert Hall and everything for three years, for at least me anyway, three years. And so it's quite nice to actually be here and be around everyone that I've been studying with and, yeah, just kind of get a sense of the atmosphere. Because the other thing is, for three years, you, we also see Commemoration Day and everyone kind of experiences it and we kind of get stuck just looking at it. So it's quite nice to be part of it too. Any advice for new graduates starting, having been through this whole process now? Enjoy it. I think that's the most important thing you can do when you're here, is uh, not to get caught up in the work all the time. Obviously it's very important, but you come to university to gain so much more, so many other skills. So to, yeah, enjoy the experience. Voices there from our recent Commemoration Day celebrations. Well, finally, last week saw the scary side of life, and possibly even death, with a suitably Halloween-related fringe event as part of the wider Imperial Festival. Well, Sam Wong is still here on the podcast, and uh, Sam, you went along, didn't you? Yeah, so The Fringe is our new series of evening public events where we get our researchers in to tell people about the exciting work they do around a theme and, and the first one was a sort of Halloween science of our fears kind of theme. So I went to see what was going on and uh, talk to some of the uh, punters and see what they thought. Hello, Frank Swain. So you've just been talking about uh, the science of bringing uh, zombies back to life and you've just written a book on this subject. I have, yes. It's called How to Make a Zombie and it's in all good bookstores in April. Quite shockingly, during the talk, you took a cat and you, you had an audience member come down and cut the head off of a cat. Let's just lie down there, little kitten. There we go. And he would just cut the heads off tiny, mewling kittens. So away we go. It's important science here. Try on, keep going, keep going. All the way through. That's okay. it. Decapitation. There we go. In, in fairness, it was not a real cat. 
but most people were quite shocked by that. <laughs> yes, before Petter writes into me, it wasn't a real cat. But it was an important reenactment of some uh, rather weird research that the man called Carl Augustus Weinhold did back in the 19th century. But he seemed to cut the, the heads off a lot of cats in an effort to reanimate them. How did he try and reanimate them? He would jam their spines and their brains full of his own homemade batteries. Uh, and according to him, that's, that worked just fine. He said it worked. Yeah, he, so according to him, these, uh, this dead cat would leap into life and, and dance around playfully on his table before kind of settling down and, and falling into a more permanent sleep. Do you think he was telling the truth? Uh, probably not. And how did it work today in our reenactment? Uh, I'm afraid it didn't work for us, no. But the cat was more or less exactly as alive as it was before you put the batteries in. That's true, I hadn't thought of it that way, so in a sense it was a, a rousing success. Someone has passed me a piece of paper that says I've been infected with the Imperial Fringe Fever and I have to go to the Zombie Outbreak Desk for a trick or treat. I'm speaking to Deidre Hollingsworth at the Zombie Outbreak Desk. What's going on here? Oh my goodness, Sam, I'm so sorry you've been infected. So what we're doing is that we're keeping a track of who's getting infected and we're using real-time data to analyse the outbreak and draw transmission networks and things to tell us something about how people contact each other at these events, who's willing to talk to who. And you can see here from this graph that we've analysed some of the data that there's lots of people in their 20s at this outbreak. People in their 20s generally give the pieces of paper to other people in their 20s. It's just a demonstration of analysing data from an outbreak in real time. OK, so is this the kind of thing that you do in your normal scientific research? We do sometimes get involved in various outbreaks, for example. So I'm part of the MLC Centre for Outbreak Analysis and Modelling, and it was very closely involved in analysing the data from the 2009 swine flu outbreak. But we also do a lot of work on building computer models to design control interventions for outbreaks. So here we have some computer simulations of, for example, a zombie outbreak in the UK. So zombies are trying to take over the UK. How long will it take them? Where's the best place in the UK to hide from them? There's lots of red dots appearing all over the map. It's pretty scary. Oh, my goodness. And then two months later, the whole of the UK is infected. Oh, so every, everyone has turned into a zombie. There are still some dark areas in the Highlands. Are they uh, Scottish people protected from they're, zombie outbreaks? They're kind of protected because people don't often go there. And so we use that information to parameterize these models. And then we've made up some parameters for zombies. Thanks. No problem. So I'm Thomas Clayson. I'm president of the Rotic Society at Imperial College. Ooh, uh, well, I'm looking at a slightly spooky robotic arm which is flexing its fingers over here. Did you make this? Yes, yeah, so this arm was actually printed on a three-dimensional printer. Um, obviously, each component was made separately, so each of the finger joints, of which there's about three in each finger, was printed and then assembled using fishing wire to create tenders along the back and the front of each finger, which are then controlled using servos in the actual arm. Are you planning to use this robot for good or for evil? It's all for evil. Our society is rather war-based. We have a predator drone, as you can see in the corner. We also have a large robotic tank and uh, several other quadricopters, which are evil in spirit. OK, well, uh, good luck with your evil society. Thank you. My name is Matthew Tranter. I'm a PhD student with Professor Sean Hardin, and I look at the effects of adrenaline on the heart and how it may cause a heart to fail. We've got a heart here and some lungs, maybe a liver or something. Whose organs are these? So it's not a person's, it's an animal. So we bought these from a butcher's today. It's actually from a pig, so it's not human tissue at all. They've been stored now for a few days. If this was human tissue and fresh, we'd be able to tell that disease and do a mini post-mortem, but really now it's a bit late for that. It's far too late for this guy. Yeah, um, he, he's definitely dead. You mentioned that adrenaline can cause your heart to fail. Does that happen often? It's a rare disease, but it does happen. So adrenaline usually causes the heart to pump harder and faster. In some diseases, in some states, the adrenaline actually causes the heart to shut down and be less strong. So this would happen in circumstances when um, you're producing a lot of adrenaline and it, the heart is getting overstimulated, and, and, but you're saying that actually there's this change in the mechanism so that it stops the heart from becoming too stimulated and shuts it down instead. Absolutely, that's it. So it happens in periods of high stress. That may be good stress, so you just won the lottery. Maybe bad stress, a relative has just died. I hope we, we're not frightening anyone too much by showing them the, uh, the organs on display here. How have people been reacting? A few frights, and it's nice for people to actually be hands-on with what's inside them and the animals they often eat. Great, well, thanks very much. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'm Martin Glasser. I'm a clinical research fellow at the National Heart and Lung Institute, um, looking at sleep and breathing and the effects of sleep apnea on the human brain. So you've got my colleague Kerry, who's very kindly volunteered to um, be your subject here. She's lying asleep on a, a bed. Well, I don't know whether she is asleep. She's got lots of wires and monitors. Tell us what we're actually measuring here. So we're looking at real live time recording of Kerry as she tries to sleep. So we've got the two black squiggly lines are a recording of the electrical activity of her brain. So this is her EEG recordings. And it's fairly fast at the moment, which indicates that she's still awake. As she falls asleep, as she drifts off to sleep, you'll see that the activity will slow down. And as she drifts into a deeper sleep, the activity will actually go very, very, very slow. And that's an indication that she's in a very deep sleep. Kerry's been there for about two hours now. Has she shown any signs of, of getting any sleep? or has she? Been there, it's quite a noisy environment. It's not terribly conducive to sleep. There was one moment where actually her brain activity did slow down and her breathing became very regular, which implied that the conscious control had gone. And I thought, you know what, she's done it. She's dropped it off. But then uh, someone made a loud bang over in the corner of the room and she walked straight up again and has shown no sign of getting to sleep. But she, she's trying valiantly. I'm impressed with her stoicism lying there and uh, not really doing much. She's actually been looking forward to this all day. Um, ooh, well, uh, <laughs> another loud noise. <laughs> yes. I think she may well have to wait till she gets home. <laughs> anyway, Unfortunately yeah. so, yes. Thanks very much. Thank you. That report from Sam Wong at that recent Fringe event delving into the science of our fears, which brings this edition to an end. Now, of course, you can always stay in touch with us and uh, find out what's going on around the college, including details of future Fringe events. All the details are via our news and events website, imperial.ac.uk slash news. Another address for you is our media library. There's loads of video and audio up there. Check that out, imperial.ac.uk slash imedia. Well, I'm Gareth Mitchell. Thank you very much indeed for your company, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.